Well, we're continuing our series in Colossians, and today's Bible reading is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Uh, you can follow that uh, in your Bibles at home, in the service sheets that you might have printed off or on the screen in front of you. Colossians chapter 3, 1 to 11. So if you've been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. For you have died and your life is now hidden with the Messiah in God. When the Messiah who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, put to death whatever in you is worldly, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you must also put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of his creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's an outline there under your uh, under the passage. Uh, you can take notes on the sheets you've printed off. There's an opportunity for discussion over morning tea or lunch after the service. Uh, there's also an opportunity using the comments box down the bottom, not just to send your registration for church, but to raise any questions or any uh, feedback you might have about the resources we've put together. In 2019, I and my family moved from, Narrab- from Weewar to Narrabri. From Weewar to Narrabri. My postcode changed. I transferred and so I was transformed. I no longer bought my daily newspapers from Roxanne at the Weewar News Agency. I now bought them from Jody and Mel at the Narrabri News Agency. I no longer bought bread from Anthony at the Wee Wall Bakery and I now bought bread from Watson's Bakery. I no longer went to Tenil at Palmer's Markets for my luxury treats. I now bought them from Dave at Yield. My postcode changed and so did my behaviour. I had been transferred and so I was transformed. That's a fairly trivial example, isn't it? But it captures a little of what we're turned to look at now in the second part of Colossians. If Colossians chapters 1 to 2 establish the truth of who Christians are, they're in Christ, they have all they need to be truly human, that Jesus as Lord is sufficient for all of their life, that they've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God whom he loves, then Colossians chapters 3 to 4 looks at how this leads to transformed behaviour, the type of transformed behaviour that comes with this transfer. Put simply, if this is who you are, if you are in Jesus, if Jesus as Lord is enough, then live like it. Live as you are. Let me pray and we'll look at that together. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that in Jesus we have all we need because connected to the Him, His story is now our story. Father, as we understand how that transfer transforms us, please apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. On that point two on the outline, a look at verse one with me. So if you've been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. The if here is not a possibility. It's a fact. It's it's a a fact that's assumed. Uh, If this is true, and we all know it is, then all this follows on. So what is the if all about? Well, Paul and Timothy make sure that we realise that the central figure in this if is the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus He's the one promised by God to deal with human sin, to roll back the sin of the world and its consequences in this world. 
We've already seen who he is and how capable he is. Remember, Neil working us through Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20. He's unmistakably the key figure here in these first four verses. His title or his role is mentioned five times in four verses. And the key issue is this. If you are connected to him, and we know that you are, then so. Did you see that repeated three times? If you are connected to him, verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, with him. Paul and Timothy want to remind their readers of what people have, what any person has if they're connected to Jesus. Remember that Neil helped us understand this so memorably from Colossians 2, 8 to 15, that if you're connected to Jesus, if you trust him, taking him at his word and living like it, then what is it? His story is now your story. When he died, you died and your sins were paid for. When he was raised from the dead, you were raised to new life and your judgment was now shown to be dealt with. When he lived the perfect life, it's now been granted to you freely. When we were dead in our rebellion against God, Jesus lived the life we could never hope to live and it was all done publicly. So there's nothing secret, nothing obscure, nothing exclusive about what God was doing in Jesus. And in all of this, Jesus was established as the Lord of all things. And through being the Lord of all things, those who are connected to him have a change of postcode. They're transferred from the domain of darkness, from death, rebellion, enmity with God, into Jesus' kingdom, to life, reconciliation with God, completely new existence. Because of all that Jesus has done, we need do no more. In fact, we can't do any more. And we can know God completely. Jesus has done it all for us. He's dealt with our sin. And through him we can know God perfectly because he is fully God. Paul and Timothy want their readers, the Christians in Colossae, people like us in Narrabri, to know that Jesus as Lord is enough. They must not be led away from this truth. Paul and Timothy want them to know what life with him as Lord is like. Remember Colossians 2, 6 to 7. Now I want you to notice the very careful way that Paul and Timothy have set this out, even as they've emphasized the general principle for their readers. Walk with Jesus as Lord just as you received him. It all begins with getting their identity straight. They're in the kingdom of Jesus, transferred from darkness, by what Jesus has done for them, not by what they have done to get in. They know God because Jesus has revealed him, not because they've discovered God or because they warrant such access or relationship. Their identity is established first by Jesus as Lord and then their behaviour flows out of that. They are this, in him with Jesus as Lord, and so they should live like this. The identity of Christians is fixed. It's fixed in Jesus and by what Jesus has done. And so they live like it and never the reverse. They've been transferred and so they live transformed. And so we start to see that here in verses 1 to 4. As Paul and Timothy remind their readers of their identity, they constantly emphasize this fact, live as you are. In verse 1, if your life is connected to Jesus who now lives and reigns over the whole universe, well then your desires and priorities are connected to the Jesus who rules over the whole universe. Uh, In verses 2 to 3, if your life is connected to Jesus, if it's hidden in Jesus, if your life with you as God instead of God has died, then live as if Jesus is your boss in your mind, in your view of the world, in the way you think and assess and comprehend and understand. Uh, In verse 4, if your life is Jesus, and it is, remember Colossians 2 verse 13, then your future is assured and it's wonderful and defined and definite even as this world decays and dies and deforms. Put simply, If your life is connected to Jesus, if Jesus is Lord is enough, if you are in him, if he is your Lord completely, then live like it. 
Now, before we go any further, let me draw out three brief applications. First, let's make sure we get the order straight or right. If your life is in Jesus, the behaviour will follow. Our behaviour never makes him Lord. Our behaviour never changes our human nature. Our behaviour never deals with our sin. We've just been looking at that last week. It is change that comes from what Jesus has already done. Second, there's no negotiation here. There are no sub-clauses that allow exemptions or exceptions. If your life is in him, then all your life is in him. He has all your life. He's Lord of all your life. He's the one who claims all of you. Third, if you're not in Jesus, then what are you in? What defines you? You're in yourself. You remain an enemy of God. You're still in death. You're still a rebel against God, still thinking you need to do more and know more to get right with God. You still think that Jesus isn't significant and you are more significant. If you are in you, then where does that lead? I'm at point three on the outline, reading sections like verses one to four can often lead to accusations. Uh, Sometimes they have some substance. Accusations that Christians live with their heads in the clouds. They're so focused on the stuff up there that they're disconnected with the life down here. Nothing could be further from the truth. After all, Jesus achieved all he did for humans in this dusty, broken world. We live in this dusty, broken world. He rules in this dusty, broken world. Our lives as his people are expressed in this dusty, broken world. In fact, as Paul and Timothy unpack what it means to live as you are, to walk in him, they turn their attention to concrete, tangible, real behaviour and relationships. And the command that we're about to look at highlights the finality, the completeness of this change in identity, this transformation that comes from the transfer that God's people have been granted. Look there in verse 5. Therefore, put to death whatever in you is worldly, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. To turn to our rather trivial opening illustration, I cannot drive to WeWar to buy my papers, bread and coffee. That would be ridiculous. I live in Narrabri, and so I buy my paper, bread and coffee in Narrabri. The reality of the transformation in God's people, the transformation that comes because they've been transferred, because they have a new identity, because they're in in him, the reality of that transformation is complete, it's final, it's all-encompassing, just like death. That's why that imagery of put to death is so striking and in your face. Death is final. Death is complete. Death is all-encompassing when it comes to a person. There's no coming back from death. If you are in him, your old way of life, the life of the domain of darkness where you were the boss and everything was in rebellion against God, if you are in him, so your old way of life is dead. And Paul and Timothy list five aspects, five vices, if you like, of that way of life. Now, from a Jewish perspective, these were the marks of the life of a person who had no God except themselves. Our experience accords with that reality when we look at the world. I look there at the last one, greed, which is idolatry. The word for greed here is one connected with an insatiable, unstoppable, ravenous desire for more and more. Uh, It's connected inseparably with idolatry because such a desire, such an insatiable desire, such a ravenous, unstoppable desire has only one focus and it's me. It places I back in the middle of life. And so it's the key marker of what a life defined by sin is. Now we rightly connect such greed to wealth and material resources, but it's also inseparably connected to pleasure and experience, a connection that's often seen 
in an aspect that's fundamental to our human nature, our sexuality, and its exploitation. That's why it's no surprise that the other four markers of the worldly life are sexual. Look at them there in verse 5, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire. The world that is broken and dusty, this world operates with me and our I at the centre. And with that centre, insatiable, unstoppable, ravenous desire rules. The desire for me or I to be satisfied materially, experientially and sexually. The damage that this causes is untold. It's heartbreaking for both the sinner and those sinned against. It stains everything around us if we live this way. That way of life rightly brings God's judgment for the way in which it perverts his design and damages his image bearers. Just look there at verse 6. Because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. But if you are in him, then I am not at the center. Me is not at the center. And Jesus is as Lord. If you are in him, so you have been transferred and so you are transformed and so you are made fully human. This means that the old way of life has no place in your life, in the life of someone connected to Jesus. Look at verse 7. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Jesus is Lord, we are not. Our desire is now fixed on Jesus and his rule. Remember verses 1 to 4? In this we are fully human. And so we're not the slaves of an unstoppable, ravenous, insatiable desire for more and more. And we treat things like pleasure and sexuality as they should be, part of the full expression of what it means to bear God's image, God's way. So what does that look like in everyday life? Well, let me make four simple observations to apply. First, if Jesus is our Lord and we are in him, and if we have been transferred, then this transforms our attitude to desire, to sex. This foundation in him should permeate every decision we make about sex and desire. I don't mean just in terms of keeping sex for marriage. We'll turn to that in a second. I mean in how we view sex in our music in our favourite TV shows, in our movies, in our internet usage, in the songs we dance to and the way in which we relate. Second, we must remember that God actually created sex for a right place and relationship between one man and one woman in marriage. And we should give thanks to God for this. Here is his design that protects and brings safety and wisdom and rightness and the right expression of love and what it means to have Jesus as Lord. Third, we must recognise the incredible damage that sexual sin brings within God's people. And at this point in this letter, Paul and Timothy are talking to God's people, not the world out there. On the one hand, there are the spectacular sins that garner a fair bit of media attention, the failure of affairs and the failure through pornography. Just look at what is happening to Jerry Falwell Jr. in America at the moment. The damage that these failures bring is deep and far-reaching. On the other hand, the damage wrought by unwise and overly relaxed attitudes towards sex, not treating the images and music and downloads seriously, can be just as significant. Such laziness brings a gradual inoculation against the damage wrought by sexual sin and it leads down a gradual slope where our walk becomes indistinct from the world around us. Fourth, we must bear in mind the strenuous nature of the command here, put to death. In all seriousness, we should take advantage of every available means to apply this. In second year at Moore Theological College, as we all sat in chapel, The college recognised the danger of not putting to death and so they bought every student and every staff member a subscription to Covenant Eyes, an internet software accountability program. Every student and staff member had it. From the head student in fourth year 
to the most insignificant member of the cleaning staff. The same goes in this diocese, the Anglican Diocese of Armidale. Every ministry worker has access to the same program. To take put to death seriously means being transparent in our relationships and conversations. The you here is plural. It means accountability to each other. It means making sure that our desires are reworked as we read God's self-revelation every day. It means constant prayer. Now, the next command is not as stark or as final as put to death, at least in how it looks. I'm at point four on the outline. But this section is equally all-encompassing. Look there in verses eight to nine. But now you must also put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his practices. Almost a mirror structure, isn't it? A command, five vices with the last expanded, and then a statement of why this must be the case. In this command, the focus is not on the idolatrous nature of sin, which can be individualized, but on the communal nature. It's worth remembering that this whole book is communal. Singular personal pronouns are few and far between. And all the yous of this section are Jephenic yous. They're plural. The vice is here. And this carries on into the command in verse 9. They're all community-based. They're well-nigh impossible outside relationship. When people are in Christ, they're in a new community where everyone else is connected to Jesus. That's that body imagery from earlier on in chapter 1 and into chapter 2. But even more specifically, just like the first list of vices picked up an aspect of human identity, our sexuality, so this list focuses on another aspect of our human identity, the way we speak, the fact that we are communicating creatures. Humans are verbal communicators, and it's hard to verbally communicate outside relationship. We're created to speak. So it's no surprise to see Paul focus on our speaking here and what it communicates when he considers our walk with Jesus as boss. How God's people speak, what they say to each other and about each other is an indicator of where their identity is founded. Our lips express what we think. Nothing we say is accidental. They must communicate that we are citizens in God's kingdom. Our language and speech must be rid of anger and rage. It's language that must not be malicious or slanderous. Even more so, our humour and communication so it should never be filthy, should never be impure. Again, what does this look like in everyday life? Let, let me make three simple observations. All of us speak. And so all of us must put off certain ways of speaking. For those of us who have quick tongues, then we must be extra careful with how we use them. The discipline of pausing and praying is a good one to develop. For those of us who love to share information, perhaps under the guise of prayer points, we need to exercise discretion. I'll come to that in a moment. And perhaps pausing and praying is a good habit to develop. Secondly, part of implementing this putting off is realising the need for discretion. Our world is the world of immediate and often uncensored communication. Only today could there be a means of communication called TikTok and Twitter. Whilst not all of us use those means of communication, the prevalence of that communication affects all of us. Not everything need be said. Not every emotion need be communicated. Thirdly, understanding God's grace towards us, his free gift to us at the moment we deserve his right condemnation. Understanding God's grace towards us will inevitably help us control our anger, rage, slander, malice, especially in our language. You see, grace should mean that we view others realistically and with great patience. The things that provoke our angry speech or slander or rage or frustration are actually the very sins that lead to God's grace being evident in our lives as he forgives us. In this sense, grace is the great leveller, the great cleanser. The life of God's people 
is the walk with Jesus as Lord, Colossians 2, 6 to 7. It's living as we are, being who we are, living as you are. It views essential human attributes like sexuality and speech in fundamentally different ways because Jesus is Lord. Now, as a way of summarising all this, what they've already said, Paul and Timothy finish with identity and behaviour, albeit this time in the context of community. Look at verses 9 to 11 with me. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who's being renewed in knowledge according to the image of his creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, see the enslaved and free, but Christ is all and in all. It's important to grasp as a way of closing out here the way in which Paul and Timothy have phrased this closing section. They've come back to identity and behaviour and the connection as a way of closing this part out. In the language of putting off and putting on, they've captured a common day-to-day activity. Just think of the end of a work day or the end of a sporting event or the end of a gym session. But two things stand out here. First, the tense of these phrases. They're both participles. The tense is aorist. It's a completed final event viewed wholly completed. The putting off, the putting on are not day-to-day activity. They're one-off events that have happened once for all in Jesus. And second, this putting off and putting on are not surface or cosmetic changes like clothes. No, they're complete human nature and identity transformations. The putting off was the dealing with our nature as people in Adam, a people who are by nature rebellious against God. That happened once. The putting on is the taking on of the fullness of humanity in Jesus in being so closely identified with him that his story is now our story. That happened once. And the rest of our lives is getting used to it, living as we are. New people, completely changed. To experience this one-off event, to be connected to Jesus, is to be completely assured of the change in your human nature and to be placed in a completely new community. Remember that Jesus was the firstborn from among the dead? That's us. There is a renewal here that is at the level of what it means to be human and to know humanity. The change comes from knowing God, knowing his will, and thus by him being remade in his image through that. It's language that takes us back to creation. It's language that recalls becoming full and complete, like in Colossians 2, 8 to 15. It's language that captures the radical break being a Christian makes because Jesus is Lord and has transferred us into his kingdom, a new people. To put it simply, Paul and Timothy want to finish by reminding their readers, the Colossian Christians and us, to live as you are. In this community, there is no lying. But even more than that, in this community, the fundamental distinctions that the world enforces and loves are removed. Here in the community of God, this new humanity, none of the racial, ethnic or social distinctions that our world throws up exist. There is just unity because Jesus is our Lord. Now let me make some simple observations about how this might look like day to day. First, let me encourage you that if you are in Jesus, you are completely new and your old nature has been dealt with. The rest of your life is getting used to that. That'll be tough. It'll be a battle. There will be strenuous activities like putting to death and putting away but the fundamentals of your identity are established. You have been transferred. And now you are getting used to what that transformation looks like. Let me also say that as Paul and Timothy set this out, they're not removing the distinctions that still exist in this world. There are still racial distinctions There are still sexual distinctions. Just look down a little further and there are husbands and wives and children. But what they are saying is that within the community of God's people, because we're a new humanity, our primary identity is in Jesus. And so 
I don't think I can be blunter than Paul, but I'm going to give it a go. There must be no dishonesty, no lying, no deceit, no lies amongst the people of God. That is a betrayal of trust, a denial of grace, and a fracture of the unity we share. I want to emphasize this point because I can think of a number of occasions I've experienced in parish ministry where people in the towns I've lived and worked in have said, we've left that Christian community because they don't tell the truth. They're hypocrites and they're dishonest. Dishonest in relationships, dishonest in business. God's community here in Narrabri should be known for its fundamental honesty, its fundamental transparency, its fundamental integrity, its fundamental consistency. Bring it down more closely. Hearths truths should be full truths. Protection by twisting the truth should be done away with. Exaggeration to improve my standing should be removed. All of our communication should be honest, clear, transparent. I don't think I can be blunter than Paul, but I'm going to try again. There must be no hint of racism, sexism or snobbery within the community of God in Narrabri. There have been times in my interactions with God's people during parish ministry where I have been shocked at the casual racism, the casual sexism, the casual snobbery and bullying. It's left me speechless. Within God's people, there should be no such hint. We're all sinners deserving judgment. We're all sinners receiving grace. We're all sinners with the same Lord. And this community relates to each other in such a way that displays grace as everyone watches. Our transformation will deepen in God's grace as we grasp his will and revelation more deeply. It's no mistake that Paul and Timothy in Colossians 1, 9 to 10 pray for our knowledge of God's will to deepen and then link it to our transformation here in chapter 3. Knowledge of God and his will and Jesus as Lord, such knowledge is to be sought after, to be treasured. You'll never get to the depths of it. It's at this point that God's word should be read and read and read and read and read and read and meditated upon and meditated upon. Christian books should be devoured either on pages or by listening. Opportunities to know God sees. Let me give you two very simple opportunities. Meet in a Bible study group. Perhaps, secondly, undertake an online course or external studies through a reputable, gospel-loving Bible college. Being what we are is not just an individual thing. All of us as individuals are citizens of a new kingdom and members of a community. Our community must display its walk with Jesus as Lord. Be what you are. If Jesus is our Lord, and Paul's argument so far has said that he is, we must walk like it. His Lordship has won us forgiveness that is undeserved. His Lordship has transferred us from the domain of darkness into his own kingdom. Uh, His Lordship has won us reconciliation with God that is undeserved, given us new life when we were corpses. Our identity, our life is now inseparably bound to the truth that Jesus is Lord. His story is now our story, our Lord especially. And our lives must display this. They are transformed because we're transferred. Live as you are. Our lives are not a moral striving to be good, but are to display that we are God's. Our lives are not a drudgery weighed down by laws that we don't delight in, but they are a delightful display of being delivered into God's kingdom. Our lives are not unrealistic pie-in-the-sky existence, but an everyday exhibition in day-to-day speech, relationship and identity that we have been transferred and so we are transformed. Let me form, Let me say it again. Live as you are. Let me pray. Father, thank you that in Jesus we've been transferred and so transformed. Father, help us to live as we are, changed in every part.
And so through this, display that Jesus as Lord is enough. Amen.